loud. With Christmas right around the corner, many of us will get the opportunity to spend some extra time with our spouse and our loved ones, um, which is an awesome thing, right? Uh, until like day four, when you're like, oh, kind of annoying. I've spotted an area of potential conflict, and I, it's through extensive research of being in a relationship myself. Um, so this is all firsthand knowledge is what I'm telling you. And this is something I've recently come to understand about myself and my wife. Um, Dave Ramsey calls it the nerd and the free spirit. Um, I'm calling it the detail-oriented versus the big picture. In most relationships, there tends to be one of you that likes the details. Like, give me the, the, the intricate process that you worked in. One's like, hey, give me the bottom line. What's, what do I need to know? Like, what state are we going to? I don't need to know the path. Just tell me where we're going. Um, I love to go in and tell my wife, like, here's the conclusion, but here's the 17 steps I thought through to get to the conclusion. Aren't you amazed at my brilliance? She's like, no, just tell me the bottom line. Are you the big picture person or are you the detail person? Turn with me to John chapter one. John chapter one is where we're going to be at today. And uh, it's fascinating the differences between the gospel writers. Mark jumps right in and his immediate action right from the get-go. He's like, they did this, then they did this, then they did this, then they did this. It's like a machine gun fire just coming at you. Mark and Luke are, are uh, Matthew, sorry, Matthew and Luke are much the same way. Luke uh, states in his gospel, I sat down to, to give you an accurate account of what happened. Those three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are very concerned with what happened. And then tying it back into the Old Testament. But John is this fascinating, different Gospel. It stands out. If you read the four Gospels, you're like, this one doesn't fit the other three. And it's kind of the way, the the reason he wrote it. John wrote it, he was the last one to write the Gospel. Uh, He was the, the fourth in line. And John wrote it really as, as an old man. Uh, he, he lived a full life. Most of the other apostles all got martyred and, and died. Um, but John is in exile, and so he's, he's alone, he's isolated, and he's, frankly, old. <laughs> he's sitting there thinking about life and, and thinking about his interactions with Jesus And so where the other Gospels are really focused on what actually happened, John is pondering the why. Why did this happen? Why is Jesus here? What what is the reason behind all of it? And John was also known as, he called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. They seem to have this intimate relationship. And so the Gospel of John feels so different because he is the picture thinker. He's the one contemplating the why behind it all. And so we come to John chapter 1, and it's this just radically different introduction than all of the other Gospels. But all of John chapter 1 fits into John's worldview. In the last series we we did called Reality, we talked about uh, the story of reality. And John has a very specific story of reality in mind when he starts in John chapter 1. So in order for us to get into the story in John chapter 1, we need to take a brief overview of all of history, okay? So we're going to take a quick look through the Old Testament, and it starts in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. So right away, the author of Genesis introduces the main character of the story, who is God. And then he goes on to describe the world. And the earth in Genesis 1-2 was formless, void, and dark. So he introduces the main character as God. And then there's this dark and empty, isolated mass called earth. And then in verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light. But Joe talked about this last week, where the light wasn't the sun, the moon, and the stars. The light is 
the glory of God himself. So God, is, God introduces himself, says, I am God, and then steps into creation and says, I am the light of the world. The light of God's glory is what filled the earth before the sun, the moon, and stars. So right away is this introduction to this main character who is both God, the divine supreme being of the universe, but then also he ties himself to light, right in Genesis 1, verse 2. And then as God, as the story of Genesis unfolds, he, he goes into creation and, and he looks in day four, uh, in verse 14, it says, and God said, let there be light. And so God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. But the reason why he created them is interesting. We'll see this tied in later. But God created them as physical reminders of his glory, of his light. Say, I'm going to give you guys some reminders. And then he says, you know what? Let's also give them my very image and likeness just in case they forget what the images are for. What those reminders are for. I'm going to create ambassadors to this world that are in my image and likeness. And we call them humanity. Mankind. So God cre- created man. And it says uh, in Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our image and likeness. And so God created these image bearers, image bearers of the light. And in Genesis 2, 7, it says, and God breathed into their nostrils the breath of life. And so man became a living being. So we're introduced to God as the source of light, and then kind of these two different images, one as the physical embodiment, the one living it out, and then one as the, the, in the created order, the sun, the moon, the stars. These two different types of images of the light. But we know not everything stayed perfect. In Genesis chapter 3, we see the abandonment of the light. We see the choice that mankind makes, the first man and woman. They say, I'm not satisfied to be made in the image and likeness of God. I would rather be God. I don't want to be in the image of the light. I don't want to carry the image of the light in me. I want to be the light itself. And in doing so, rather than mankind becoming God, we became less than human. Rather than us moving into the exalted position we wanted as the light, we lost the light that God gave us. Now this sounds like Eastern mysticism or something, right? Like touch the light inside of you. But this is the story John is telling. This is the story the Gospels are telling. This is the story the writer of Genesis is telling. And then Genesis 3 through Malachi chapter 4. The rest of the Old Testament is the story of how the light interacts with darkness. Whether it's the darkness in an individual or the darkness in the world as a whole. It's the story of the light touching the darkness. Isaiah 9 describes this darkness that fell over humanity. Isaiah 9, or 59, 9 and 10 say, Therefore justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, and behold darkness. For brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope for those who, we grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in twilight. Among those full of vigor, we are like, dead men. The darkness of this world is not a physical darkness. It's cloudy today, but the sun rises. There's this physical light still, but the world is in spiritual darkness. Last week, Joe gave a couple of implications of the light. What does it mean when something's in the light? So what does it mean when something's in the dark? We have phrases like, it's their darkest hour. 
that gives us some glimpse. But I think even just from this Isaiah passage, there's three implications of darkness. The first is confusion or chaos. We stumble around. How many of you have ever stubbed your toe in the dark? I did it just this morning. I walked into one of these chairs when I was walking through the dark here. There's confusion. You don't know where everything is as it should be. There's confusion. There's chaos. Think of what happens when a city goes dark and there's rolling blackouts. The confusion, the chaos. We go to a stoplight that's out. Like we've never figured out how to use a stop sign before. But you go to an intersection where there's no light. There's confusion and chaos. But that leads to the second implication of darkness. And that is hopelessness. A world in darkness, physical darkness, and a world in spiritual darkness is a place without hope. Which leads to the third implication. Death. Think what would happen to our physical world if it was without the physical light of the sun. Most of what we would see would die. We even know this in our human physiology. The way God designed us, it's like we crave the sun. We need the light of the sun. I grew up in uh, Michigan, which is the second cloudiest state in the nation. Behind Alaska. Think about like the state that literally is dark all day long for a couple of years. And so there'd be whole months where you would go where you like would not see the sun. It's one of the things I most appreciate about Kansas. We have so many sunny days. It's rare that we have a couple of these gloomy days in a row. But physically, uh, psychologists talk about, uh, it's called SAD. Okay, I know that's a goofy name, but seasonal affective disorder. We get gloomy. We get a little depressed and down when we don't have the physical sun to brighten our spirits. You think that's by accident? You think God said, I'm going to design you with this goofy little thing in you to remind you that you're in spiritual darkness and you need the spiritual light. The Bible describes us in darkness as bound in sin, blinded by sin, dead in sin. These are all images that that convey darkness. You're bound in a gloomy jungle. You're blinded. You don't have the light and you're dead. Notice Isaiah concluded that way. Among those full and vi- full of vigor, we are like dead men. That's the biblical description of darkness. And so the Bible, the Old Testament is the story of the light intersecting with darkness. But comes this crazy point. Malachi chapter 4 ends, by the way, with an illusion talking about there's going to come an announcer. But then there's 400 years of silence. Of no hint of the light piercing the darkness at all. There's no sign of the light anywhere at all. And God's chosen people, what's going on here? Did the light disappear? Is it gone? But that doesn't mean that things weren't happening. Think about, think about what was happening 400 years ago in our world, just in our continent here. That's pretty fascinating, right? Like Plymouth was just getting founded. Like the first colony in America was going on. That's 400 years ago. That's a long time for darkness. But about six, in the 6th century BC, there was a Greek philosopher named Heraclitus who was looking around at the world and doing his Greek philosophy thing and said, you know what? As I look out, it seems like there's like a reasoning force behind this world that I can observe. It almost like there's like a plan or an intellect here. This is weird because it looks a lot like the planning and the reasoning that mankind does. It's like, what word should I call this? This force, this divine force that orders the universe. And he said, ah, we've got a good word for that meaning plan or word or reason, it's the word logos. 
the Greek word logos. Now you guys get to be nerds like me. Logos. And so that thought became part of pop culture, frankly. And it was just this common term to describe the divine force behind everything that gives it reason and purpose and plan. And so then we're back to John, who's after 400 years of silence, he's sitting there after the life of Jesus saying, how does Jesus fit in to the story of the Bible? Now let's look at John 1.1. As we read this, as you look at it, if you could follow along, that would be great. Because what I'm going to do is take out the pronouns. Uh, through this passage, there's a lot of pronouns used. And I'm just going to use the proper noun every time for what it's talking about to hopefully reduce some confusion. I, honestly, when I went and studied this, I was like, I've got to just write this out because this gets really confusing. So it'll sound clunky as you read it and I read it, but it'll, I hope it'll bring some clarity. So John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, wait, where does that sound? In the beginning the, was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The word was in the beginning with God. All things were made through the word and without the word, was not anything made that was made. In the word was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Remember we said 400 years without the light? So John opens his gospel by saying, the light is not gone. The light still shines. Darkness has not overcome it. God has not abandoned the world or humanity. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. John 1.1, in the beginning, the word. Fascinating thing here. We're not reading it in the Greek. We're reading it in the English. But let me tell you something fascinating. What do you think the English translation for the Greek word logos is? Word. So what John here is tying this Greek thought, this Greek philosophy in with Genesis in a new and exciting way. He's saying, you know what? That divine reasoning behind everything, that is God. And he's going to add to that and build on that as we go. In the beginning, God, this divine word, this logos, was with God. So in some way, it is separate from God. It is not just God, but it is separate from God. But he also was, was with God and was God. These two separate things are one thing. In the beginning, the logos, the word, was with God and was God. And we see that creation was all done through the word. And we see that God breathed life into man. Look at verse 4. In the word was life. And the life was the light of man. So here he's saying, In the beginning was the word. The word was the life of man. The light. Light, sorry, life moves to light. He's comparing those two things. This whole passage is lots of comparing. So light equals life. Now let's go back to Genesis and see what happened in Genesis 2-7. It talked about God breathing life into mankind. John is now saying light and life are parallel things. They're equal things. So when God is breathing life into someone, he is also breathing light into someone. So to say that we are God's image and likeness means that we, with his life in us, also have his light in us. Any of you ever sang the song, This Little Light of Mine? That's this biblical truth. 
that you are the light of God. You are carrying the light of God in you. But let's remind ourselves of what happened in Genesis chapter 3. Not satisfied with this little light that's in me. As the image of God, we said, no, I want to be the God. I want to be the greatest light. And in doing that, in desiring that, we gave up this little light of mine. And instead became darkness. Man chose death. Because notice, light and life are comparison. So when we chose darkness over life, what did we also choose? We chose death. This is why back in Genesis chapter 3, the tree of life was taken away from humanity. The light went out of humanity. The life went out of humanity. But God says, the light is not overcome. Just because we haven't seen the light in over 400 years does not mean that the light has been beaten by darkness. He says, no, the light still shines and darkness, verse 5, has not overcome it. And then John moves on with his next thought. Saying there is life in this death. There is hope in this hopelessness. There is reasoning in this chaos. There is order in this chaos. Verses 6 through 18 lay out the Gospels. This is the story John is going to spend the rest of the book telling, and we're going to cover it in the next 30 minutes. So 6 through 13, again, I'm going to take out the pronouns and put in the proper nouns. Follow along with me. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. John came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through John. John was not the light. But he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. The light was in the world, and the world was made through the light, yet the world did not know the light. The light came into his own, and the light's own people did not receive the light. But to all who did receive the light, who believed in the light's name, the light gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John here says, light still shines, verses 1 through 5, and that the light has now entered into the darkness. The light has not left this dark world alone. No, he's, he's made his way into it. And just like Malachi 4 ends with talking about the announcer, John picks up and says, there's going to be someone to announce it. And his name is John. We call him John the Baptist. Because he came pr- saying, hey, the kingdom of light is here. The light has come back. Isn't this amazing? And it says that John is to bear witness. This is the idea of a uh, public trial. Of someone standing on the witness stand, saying, what did you see? What did you hear? What do you know? And all John is doing is saying, the light's coming. I'm not the light. The light is coming right after me. He's coming right next. He's, he's here. That's John's whole job. And not so that we believe in him, but we believe in the light that's coming right after him. Prepare the way. Verse 9 has... A fascinating statement. Is this true light or is this false light? He says, hey, the true light has come. Which kind of made me stop and like, wait, what's false light? The LED lights? Right, like, what do you mean false light? Shockingly, again, the answer is back in Genesis chapter 1. 
Because when God created the world, remember day four when he said, I'm going to set up a day, light to rule the day and another light to rule the night? We call them the sun, the moon, and the stars. These physical images, these physical reminders of his greater glory. But we kind of lost sight that they're just reminders of him. That they're meant to point us to the greater spiritual reality. That there's a light that makes those things look ridiculously dull by comparison. It may have been a while since you were a kid and you played the sun stare game. Or maybe that was just me. How long can you stare at the sun? Six seconds? Something like that? That's meant to point us back to the fact that God's glory makes that look lame. The fact that when you walk out at night, and I love living here in Kansas, because you walk out at night and if it's a clear night, you're like, oh my goodness. That's meant to point us to the fact that God is the one who spoke and those are created. The universe of stars is created. Something I love to do is try and focus on a dark spot in the night sky. And I think if you focus long enough and hard enough at a dark spot, you find another star. That's just me testing something out. You try it sometimes. Blow your mind. The glory of God. The light of God. But what has humanity chosen to do with these reminders for most of human existence? Romans says this says, we have chosen to worship the creation rather than the creator. These physical reminders that God set up to, hey, point, these are to remind you that I'm really big and really awesome and really great. Instead, we were like, oh, let's worship those things. And God's like, for most of human existence, we have worshiped the sun, the moon, and the stars. Almost every single ancient culture worshiped them. And by the way, it's not we, we like to think we've progressed so much in our Western culture, but we still have horoscopes in every single newspaper. We still worship feeling good, the light of the sun, and being tan and beautiful. But remember what God created kind of two different things. He said, one, these are just physical creations. One is his image and likeness. It's another light bearer. God created the light inside of us, but we chose to ignore that. We've turned our worship from the creator to the created. And just like God says, I made you in my image and likeness, that means that we have some of the light inside of us. We've chosen to turn our back on it and grow dark, but we're that other image. And I believe that's where our culture spends a lot of its time worshiping. It's at the false light of self. Just do what makes you happy. Get what's yours. And so, yeah, we don't worship at an idol of some other image, but we worship a lot of our time and energy and effort at worshiping at the altar of myself. The false light. And John is saying, the true light has come that has made all of those other false lights look ridiculous by comparison. And the question is that we should all ask is, why don't we know the difference? Why don't we know the difference between the false light and the true light? This should be abundantly clear, right? The light of God's glory versus us. The light of the divine supreme being that organized and orchestrated all of the universe versus us. I feel like the only, only the most very, very arrogant of people would be like, yeah, I can compare to that. Verse 10, it says, he came into the world, but the world didn't know him. Were those people just dumber than us back then? John 3 gives the answer. In the most uh, famous verse in the Bible. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him won't perish, won't die, but have everlasting life. But in that same discord, we don't pick up the next couple of verses because that's John 3, 16. But in 3, 19, he says this. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world 
and people loved the light? Darkness. Rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come to the light, lest his works should be, bes- should be exposed. See, in the story of Genesis, Adam and Eve chose to abandon the light. But just like them, every one of us have chosen to abandon the light, to betray our very reason for existing. Rather than being a part of the light, being a part of that loving community that God has, and, uh, and being his image and representative here on the earth, we said, nah, I'd rather be the light myself. I'd rather worship at the altar of myself. And so we've betrayed our very reason for existing In wanting to be God, we became less than human. And so what is God's calling here? Why did the light enter the darkness? Lays it out in verse 11, 12, and 13. The resurrection of the light. All who do receive the light are reunited with God. And become again a part of the light, born not of the flesh, but of the will of God. Again, this is a very intentional phrase meant to bring us back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, God didn't form man of flesh. But he formed him of the dirt. And what did he do? He breathed life into him. He breathed light into him. And he says, this is what John is saying. Is that you need a second birth. You need to become spiritually alive because you are dead in your sin. You need the light to enter you again. You need new life breathed into you. You need God to do for you, to restore you, to resurrect you, back to what you were in Genesis, created as his image and likeness in this world. So to recap, God is light, created these light bearers that abandoned their purpose for existing, betrayed their purpose for existing, And turned the world to darkness. Worshipping and setting up false lights. And then John says, hey, but the light still exists. It's still out there. And he says, get this, the light has entered into the darkness. Which should lead us to the obvious next question. Is how did the light choose to enter into the darkness? Because remember, the first time he did it, at the creation of the world, Genesis 1 verse 3, he's, or Genesis 1 verse 2, he says, let there be light. And boom, he stepped into the world. So how is he going to do it the second time God steps into the world? Because if I was God, I'd be like, I'm really sick of these kind of knuckleheaded people down there. Love and darkness rather than light. I'm going to show them. Boom! And, you know, shock them in, you know, Operation Shock and Awe. God edition. How did God choose to enter the darkness? Verse 14. And the light became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen the light's glory. Glory as of the only Son. From the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about the light and cried out, This is the light of whom I said, The light who comes after me ranks before me, because the light was before me. For from the light's fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. This is the first time John explicitly ties this all together. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. The light 
has made God known. God says, John says, sorry, that the word, the logos, God, the light, the life, all of these are one being and we called him Jesus Christ. The light, just wrap your mind around, for, try to, what God, what John is trying to convey here, that this divine reasoning force behind all of creation, the logos, the light, meaning God's glory in all of his splendor that was lit up the entire world, that life itself, the very essence of life, the source of all life, is now confined in human flesh. What? That's what John is saying here. And notice, look, look at the, this. Is, I, I get to be nerdy again, right? Like, I love the details. So he says here, uh, and the word, the logos, this huge idea, the logos became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt is the word tabernacled. If you were here last week, Joe talked extensively about the Feast of Tabernacles. It's this whole beautiful image of light and life. What? This is amazing. So what the tabernacle is, just to remind everybody, is this box, this crazy, beautiful, ornate, but still a box, that the Israelites carried around in the wilderness for like years and years. And then even when they were uh, a, a country, whatever, when they were in the promised land, for several hundred years, they still had the tabernacle that was in this tent. And the tabernacle was the place the Israelites believed that God's presence literally was. It's the place that in this dark world, the light of the divine intersected. This one point in the entire world where the divine light of life intersected with the broken dark humanity was in the tabernacle. Later, Solomon built a temple and so they could retire the tabernacle. And so now the temple is this one place in the entire world where this divine light of life oversects with the human darkness and brokenness, this one physical location. And so what John is arguing here is that God no longer dwells in a box. God isn't in a building anymore. God is now in human flesh. Jesus is tabernacling among us. That's a crazy concept. That's incredible. The light has a human form, lives among humanity, and we can see him. The second half of verse 14, and we have seen his glory, the light glory, God coming down to earth, living in human. You, you want to do a crazy study? Go back and read the Old Testament, and any time humanity is interacting with the temple or the tabernacle, just see what happens, and then realize that that's Jesus in the flesh in the New Testament. Because just, just do it; it'll blow your mind. Crazy stuff is always happening around the temple and the tabernacle. Just freaky, weird stuff, and realize that that's God in the flesh in Jesus Christ. That's what John's arguing here. But why has the light come? Has the light come to obliterate darkness? Has the light come to, to obliterate all those betrayers of their purpose? John again lays it out. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace in verse 16. The deity of God in human form. This fullness of God, Colossians Two nine says it this way. For in him, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. What they're saying is that the fullness of God, the fullness of the logos, the fullness of light, the fullness of light itself dwell in 
Jesus Christ. John specifically says Jesus here. He pulls it all back in together. He says, this is who Jesus is. And he says, the reason he came is to extend grace upon grace. The reason the light has come into darkness was to restore what was broken, to resurrect what had died. And what had died was us. He doesn't want to condemn the darkness, but to restore it to the position it was meant to be. So what do we walk away from? What do we walk away with from this lesson? We talks about a lot. That since the world, since the creation has been dominated by darkness and that darkness is humanity and its choices, our own rebellion and sin, but that God came to the world as the light of life in human form. But he didn't come to obliterate, to condemn, but to resurrect and restore humanity back to the position they were intended to fulfill as God's image and likeness. Jesus is the word of life, the light that has come to resurrect us from darkness, to bring the dead back to life. John introduces his gospel this way because he wants us to see the radical nature of what is claimed at Christmas. He says, I want every one of my readers to understand that Christmas and, and, and then the years that followed, this is the radical hinge point of all of history. When light no longer just pierces the darkness temporarily, but when light came and dwelt in the darkness, when Jesus came in the fullness of God, in the, in the God, in the logos, in the word, in the life, in the light, when God indwelt a human, and when God came to this earth, so that light shines in darkness. Let's pray. God, I, I pray I leave today with a renewed appreciation for what happened on Christmas all those years ago. God, I pray it humbles me and inspires me. God, I pray that we get excited about Christmas lights, that we get excited about candles and and the sun and the moon and the stars, and, and we get excited about our role in creation because this is all pointing us back to you. God, I pray we can just, just, just get a small glimpse of how radical Christmas really was. Thank you for being the light in the darkness. In your name we pray. Amen.